All right. Well, welcome back to this week's episode of the Rock and Roll Ghost Podcast. Um, this week on our episode, we have uh, filmmaker Harry Greenberger with us. His new film, Hereafter, is uh, available on video on demand. It stars uh, Andy Carl and Christina Ricci. Uh, just remember that if uh, you're watching this, please go ahead and click that like button. If you're on YouTube, share it on social media and subscribe wherever you're read you're seeing or not reading, uh, hearing this podcast, uh, whether it be Spotify, Apple, uh, Anchor, YouTube, just, you know, share, like, subscribe, the whole bit. Um, I, my editor, it kind of implored me to start doing that. So uh-huh, that's a smart um, thing to do. Yeah, yeah. He's a lot craftier with this stuff than I am. How are you doing today, Harry? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm hanging in there, hanging in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of cool, a lot of cool stuff behind you. Uh, oh, yeah. Is that is that your dog in the background? Uh, no, that's uh, that's actually my girlfriend is a photographer, and uh, okay. that's a book of her photographs. That's not actually placed there for the camera. That's I just keep that there. It's some very okay. Fun. No, no, it's cool. It just it caught my eye. Oh yeah, it's the best well, info. It's a book. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Uh, well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, hereafter. T- if you could kind of give the audience a little bit of an idea of what the film's about, and then we can go from there. Sure. Uh, well, it's kind of meant to be a, um, a dark, satirical, romantic comedy uh, set in the afterlife. It's about a guy who has a bad breakup and uh, finds himself in a bad frame of mind uh, to to meet somebody, uh, but then. Uh, he dies and is finds out that in the afterlife you have to be with someone you have to have true love in order to go on to the other side and and as ridiculous as that sounds um, <laughs> the idea is supposed to be that um, he's forced to find someone right at the absolute worst time of his own internal uh, feelings about relationships and he's forced to to find someone right when he's messed up and not in the position to do so and uh, it's you know it's not at all how I believe the universe would work and it's just meant to be satire <laughs> okay yeah. well you know you wrote the film as well what what inspired this and and if you could talk about what inspired it and if you could talk about the journey from the I the, the creation of the idea to writing the script to Sure. Um, the release, I guess. Sure, sure. It's been a long journey, but uh, like almost, I guess, around 11 years ago now, I, I had a breakup. Uh, and right afterwards, I started thinking, that's when all your friends start saying, you got to get out there and meet someone. You got to get back out there, go out to the bars, go out to the club, that kind of stuff. And I remember just, I kept, I was, I was focusing heavily on the idea that, well, this is the worst time in a person's mindset to, uh, to meet someone because you're your worst self right after a breakup. Nobody is uh, <laughs> nobody is usually in their best frame of mind right after somebody breaks their heart or after some you know something that they had hopes for fails. And so uh, I was I kind of got obsessed with that and I was thinking about uh, I would go out to clubs and bars with my friends and I felt like you know you've time has passed since I was dating and I felt like well now the places where I used to hang out. Uh, I'm, I'm invisible now. I'm older. It made you feel invisible. It made, you know, made me feel invisible to be back in these places. Like the places have moved on. There's new groups of people haunting them. And I felt like a a ghost in my old place. Uh, And for that reason, those ideas sort of converged. And I started thinking about how, um, you know, if I sort of set a, um, you know, like a a metaphorical gun to the character's head where he had to find somebody. The afterlife was a good way of doing it where it's like there's a ticking clock and you've got to find somebody and you're going to go back to your old places and you're going to feel invisible by being older and by being single and by, you know. And I felt like I was trying to sort of make fun of the way the world can make a person when they're single feel uh like they don't count because everything is cruelly when you're when you're newly single especially um it can feel like everything's cruelly in pairs every restaurant is is, you know uh designed for you know groups of two every concert set of tickets it's always seemed groups of two and and people go out in groups of two and, and people walk down the street in groups of two and i was trying to get across that uh 
<laughs> that sort of awful feeling of uh, feeling excluded by that. And uh, some people online misinterpreted and thought that I was single shaming with the film, but it was the opposite. I keep saying I was single complaining. I was, uh, I was not single shaming. I was, I was trying to say it's, you know, it's unfair and unnecessary that the world can make you feel like that. But that's, so then I just started kind of extrapolating from there and thinking, okay, so then, you know, what would this character be looking for? And it really started me thinking about them, you know, if you were forced to find love and it was in the afterlife, that would remove, you know, uh, child rearing and what job you had and it would remove sex. And I sort of started thinking, well, what would the nature of love be as a physical force in the universe if we posit that it exists? And, um, you know, so what would that person be looking for and what would he have to change in himself internally to be uh, somebody that would be um, worthwhile for the other person, uh, you know, to you know, to be to sacrifice everything for. Like, what would what would make what would make uh, what would make him worthy of someone's sacrifice, and what would make that person some uh, you know the the right person for him? If that makes sense. No, no, that that makes sense. Um, what was the process like on, on getting, I guess, financing, um, available and, and, and to actually make the film? I mean, what was, what was that whole experience like? Yeah, that's always, a, an arduous, uh, process. Uh, but I was lucky that, it, uh, my first film, um, it won a bunch of awards, uh, and a bunch of festivals It won like 41 awards and 25 festivals, something like that. I probably have the numbers wrong, but, um, what happened was that made it. So some of the people that I knew that had some money, um, were willing to invest more for this one and were willing to pony up more. And, and, uh, I started to seem like a safe bet. And then once you get, uh, some name actors involved, uh, then more people come aboard and uh, the process kind of uh, snowballs a little bit at that point. And, uh, you know, we had enough money to get started and then that got us some of the names involved in the cast. And then uh, you get, you know, more money, you know, uh, success breeds success, as they say. So like, if you have the success yeah. of getting the first chunk, uh, oftentimes that gets it from other people. Right. They figure that other people have their money invested. To, mm -hmm. It's a good reason to, get in and because everybody has a concerted effort to get their money back. Yeah. And I was lucky some friends that are, that had some money uh, didn't even ask to read the script. They'd seen the other film and they liked it. And, you know, one good friend who, uh, uh, who invested actually just said, I don't need to read the script. I'm not investing in the movie. I'm investing in you. And I thought like, that's, you know, yeah. that means a lot coming from people. Yeah, I, you know, I, it, it's interesting. You kind of bring something up that, that I think is interesting that another guest brought up um, about a month ago. I talked to Steve Kelby from the church, hmm. and his situation is that he has a patron right now that is like a mega rich lawyer that basically will give him money to make art. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going back to, you know, we're, there's this thing creeping in that we're going back into these weird, you know, times of, of old. Yeah. Where artists. Like were, and Michelangelo. Right. We're <laughs> just, you know, you're right. Right. And, and, and isn't that interesting? Like, you know, the, as there's all these people with money that they don't know what to do with, but they, and they like to get involved in art, but they're not artists. So they right. can't do that. So all they can do is fund it. Mm -hmm. and, and the rise in independent filmmaking, you know, where different people produce, you know, throw in their their money to a production or or whatever nowadays is is on the rise because the the studios have consolidated to the point of where I mean I'm sure another decade if there's three studios I'd be shocked. Yeah, you know, I think you're right. Um, you know, I, how, how interesting, you know, how do you, did you find that it ended up being easier to get the money than you thought it would? And, and uh, you know, I, I, I know artists have a tendency to not want to focus on money, but, you know, honestly, without it, you're, you're making a significantly different film. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we originally were, 
uh, this film was supposed to be my first film originally. We, we had mm-hmm. planned to make this film in like 2013. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, actually, I think we started trying to make it in 2012. We tried to make it in 2013. And we had you know, scheduling, actor scheduling problems and things like that. Uh, but yeah. we were going to try to make it for a, approximately one tenth of the budget that we wound up doing this for. Okay. Uh, so it was a big learning experience because that's we made my first film, Staring at the Sun, uh, for for that kind of budget, that kind of really low budget, and it was uh, it was grueling, and it was you know we we were flying by the seat of our pants and wound up uh, you know just maybe squeaking by getting that movie done for that budget. And this is a much more ambitious film with you know as you've seen with effects and mm-hmm. and bigger names and all those things that do cost more like the locations cost more and like we would have just had to I, I feel like we probably would have gotten it done for that one tenth budget but it would have been a much different film there would have probably been little to no visual effects uh, we probably uh, we would not have been able to afford the cast that we have. And uh, certainly a bunch of locations would have just been, uh, you know, a sidewalk instead of a train station. <laughs> and, uh, right. Right. Um, yeah. Well, you know, you, you feel the movie is kind of a little, little bit of oh, Jesus, a little bit of a love letter to New York and you, you filmed in New York um, I, with your first film. Where did you film that? Believe it or not, we also shot that, uh i'd say 70 percent in new york city okay uh, but we did it uh more on the cheap and a little bit more out in the boroughs and we shot about 20 some percent of it in uh in phoenix and tucson uh, uh because that's where the character that's where the story goes so um, oh, okay gotcha yeah. i haven't yeah i'm sorry i haven't seen it oh no it's all right it's uh it's hard to find right now we're working on distribution for it okay, but gotcha. i'll send it to you if you'd like to see it sure yeah, uh, yeah that'd be great yeah i'd love for you to see it it's it's a very different film it's about two hasidic teenagers who run away from the brooklyn hasidim if you know what i'm talking about it's, no uh, i have a, yeah some idea i mean yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, they they run away and try to get as far away as they can uh, to find what they assume will be total freedom in america away from mm-hmm. their in away Phoenix. from their uh, <laughs> community yeah. where they couldn't possibly probably stand out more oh, right exactly yeah yeah that's that's interesting i like the i like the idea of it um well filming in new york i mean has it, it, what is what are the 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 dealings with filming in new york i mean is it are you able to do more things because you're a smaller film do they have breaks that that you know break off between? Well, you, you know it's uh, Paramount making it. Well, you know we can definitely charge them more money. But if it's like this little guy, we can you know we can cut him a break. Well, to be honest, it has a lot to do with not just the size of the production, but how much you want to shut off other people from being able to do things. Like if you want to mm-hmm. shut off a street, that's expensive. If you yeah. want to shoot on a street but not disrupt the normal. Go, comings and goings of that street uh that's pretty much free as long as you don't uh lay down dolly track uh mm-hmm. or set up large lighting setups those things start to cost some things along and uh but the city actually works with you pretty well on uh you know, if you want to claim, say, 10 or 20 parking spaces for production, they help with that, you know, and that stuff winds up costing something. But it's still not as crazy as you would think. What gets expensive is shutting down streets or um, paying location fees to buildings and restaurants and things that, uh, you know, that wouldn't shut down ordinarily. You know, like if you're if you want to yeah. shoot like we shot in bars and restaurants, but luckily, uh, you know, our, our mutual friend, Jesse, uh, uh, was involved at some of those places and, yeah. uh, you know, gave us, uh, carte blanche to shoot in some of his bars and restaurants and things. And, yeah. um, uh, so that helped on both films. We, we took advantage of that, of his, uh, gracious kindness on both films with that, but then, um, you know, shooting in friends' apartments, but that still involves like talking to landlords and and um, accommodating the residents, accommodating the businesses on either side, and and you know it all costs something. But the funny thing was on Staring at the Sun, my first film, we were used to like places wanting, you know, sometimes you know prohibitively large fees to shoot. There was a 
there's a famous bar downtown. We just wanted to shoot a scene in their bathroom would have taken, you know, half of a day. We would have done it while they were closed and they asked for $25,000 mm. to shoot it in the bathroom. And it was like, well, that's, you know, that's just not, we possible. can find any bathroom. <laughs> yeah. But they had a really good looking bathroom. No, I get it. I get it. Like, <laughs> like if you're looking for like the, the Godfather, you know, the, the Italian restaurant kind of thing, if you're looking for something like that, it's a little harder nowadays to find a spot like that. You know what I'm saying? Like something. Sure. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we, yeah. I, I found an amazing looking bathroom and I, we had a really pivotal scene it takes place in a bathroom in the first film and uh so i had my heart set on it and i had done work at that place uh because i worked doing some music stuff too and yeah. um so i actually wrote to them after they asked for twenty five thousand dollars, and i said was there any chance you know is, is a new york production i've worked there with you guys i know you guys for all these years mm. and they so they're willing to cut it down to fifteen thousand dollars for the day which is still prohibitively expensive so we couldn't yeah, do that yeah. but but then the funny thing was for Staring at the Sun, we had paid all these fees to shoot in places in New York and people were very accommodating and very kind, but still, you know, they have to charge a fee because they're shutting down their business. Right, and then exactly. we went to, we were headed off to Phoenix and Tucson. And when we got there, um, we'd say like, can we shoot at your, at your uh, store? And they'd say, absolutely. And we'd say, okay, well, what, what would a, fee, a fair fee be? And they'd say, oh, you don't have to pay anything. So uh after paying for every location that we used in new york city we got to phoenix and our location budget i think for phoenix was essentially zero uh all the different places we shot there wasn't a single place that asked a dime to shoot there and yeah, sure. it was very friendly very accommodating <laughs> it was just a reminder that new york is it's great but it's you know also you know the rents are high here so it makes yeah, it yeah. so for a bar to shut down for a day they got a you know a big nut to crack yeah um, to to make that day worth it for them but uh we saved a lot of money on phoenix and i would say um if you don't have a lot of money in your location by the try, try Phoenix and Tucson because it's very reasonable. But uh, I was just I was just gonna say if you didn't say it, I was gonna put it out like filmmakers. If you want to make a movie cheap, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll reach out to me and I'll tell you our locations person for Phoenix, and they'll put you in touch with all those people. But um, it, it, yeah, is there any point where you just want to like say go gorilla and get a GoPro, get an iPhone, and just just literally steal a scene somewhere we've done that on both films we we did uh you know i i've been working on film crews for so long that like i'm i'm very used to that i've done things where we've been kicked out of locations by cops all those things of course um but the trick is on a sag film which is what both these were you run the risk of your your the city revoking your permit and sag oh. revoking your and stuff like that but we still did a little bit of it um there was a location we wanted to shoot in there's a part of central park that no, most people don't know about that's utterly gorgeous and doesn't look anything like anything you picture for central park and we wanted to shoot there but it's a special part of central park and so they 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 basically say no but if you have a ton of money they'll let you shoot there and we had the idea of what well, we go in we'll put the camera in the lap of a person in a wheelchair with a blanket over it and we'll go and we'll get what we need to shoot and we'll just remove the blanket every time every time we need the shot and we were ready to do it but you know production wisely said you, you risk us losing all of our permits to shoot in New York City. Yeah. And we thought of trying it on the last day. But yeah, you, you know, there were some guerrilla things. But things like when we shot at the pass station for the scenes at the train, um, they're, extremely, they're extremely kind and extremely accommodating, but it's expensive. And then they, you know, you, you pay for an eight-hour shift um and if you go one minute over you ha you have to pay for the whole next eight hour shift of all those workers and the rental of the place so the hours are tight as you know for a film eight hours isn't a lot to work with because you got to get the stuff in get it set up and and we had christina ricci on that day that's you know that's an important day we have you know yeah because you didn't have her for for uh, uh very long in the film yeah she's you know we i think we had her for a full week uh of shooting out of 22 days of shooting oh and, your, uh, your your production schedule is a little longer than i thought yeah yeah it's uh and um you know and she's great she's peppered throughout the whole movie i think so. yeah no uh, that right it i just i i thought she only came in for a, a, a smaller number of days but no we had her for i think we had her for a total of seven if i'm not mistaken and um uh and yeah she's you know she's of course you know wonderful and great to work with and and uh, terrific actress and uh 
always puts a unique stamp on everything she does. Yeah, you and in our back and forth in, in via email, you had mentioned when um, you know, I had spoken to Bill Duke that you had worked with him and her mm -hmm. on the Cemetery Man. Cemetery Club, uh, yeah. I, uh, Cemetery Club, sorry. Cemetery. That's okay. No, that's no, right. I'm, I'm confusing that with the Running Man. All uh, right. right. <laughs> I don't know why. But, that's uh, all right. Uh, 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 um, which is kind of interesting. It was interesting timing, you know, that that, that came up. Um, you know, and obviously you kept, you know, some sort of a cordial or genial relationship with her over, over the years that you were able to approach her to be in the film. No, actually, I, I, I have to admit um, that in the end, that had nothing to do with it. She didn't remember that or me, or nor should she really. She was probably like 10 or 11 years old. And you were and, uh, I was older. On the crew. Than, yeah, I was on the crew just as a camera assistant. Uh, okay. Focus. Uh, I sort of started and I started as a PA, like almost everyone in the film, but then I gripped and then I was camera assistant on hundreds of things for a long time. And then on that one, I was a camera assistant and she played, it was an incredible cast, it, you know, Bill Duke directed, but she she played Catherine Keener's daughter, Ellen Burstyn's granddaughter, and it also had Olympia Dukakis and Diane Ladd and Jerry Orbach and Danny Aiello and Wallace Shawn, Lainey Kazan, wow. all these great actors. And um, her role got trimmed down, uh, but she's still in there. And uh, we approached her through the casting director and through her agent for this. And it wasn't until she'd already said yes and was on board and said she loved the script and wanted to do the part uh, that I, I, I felt the nerve to just say to her, you, now you don't remember this, but right. I worked with you back in like 1991. I and, didn't realize that film came out back. I, I thought that was later for some reason. Oh, no, it was, it's between the two Adams Family movies. She had done the first one. It was on her way either... Right. Was about, to, was about to film the other one or had filmed it and it hadn't come out yet but so she was gotcha. she was newly famous for she she had done mermaids i think with mm -hmm. Cher, and then the first adams family made her sort of an icon and then the second one was yet to come out and uh but she was sweet to work with i asked her about the film and she said she didn't really remember much from that film she was so young she said uh, her memories yeah. mostly revolved around uh um ellen burston's uh cat that she kept in her trailer that she just adored. Gotcha. Yeah, I didn't expect her to remember me. I no, was no, 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 no. I, I didn't realize she was quite that young. I, I just watched The Hard Way with Michael J. Fox and James Woods recently, and mm -hmm. I had completely forgotten that she played Annabella Shore's daughter in that. Oh, and, wow. I didn't know that. I never saw yeah, that. Yeah, it's like I that was like so early on in her career that I, you know, completely it had been so long since I had seen that film too. And, how, how was the film? Is it good? The film holds up. It's still funny. Hmm. It's All not, right. and, and Michael J. Fox rolling around New York with a cell phone, which I have to imagine that would be the first time I can remember ever seeing a cell phone like the size of a brick. No, no, it was a uh, flip with a with an antenna. Ah, oh, wow, oh, yeah. Weird. It was it was oddly not giant. You know, for. For, you know, I, you start seeing those come in more often uh, in, in the mid '90s, but the the lightness of it was kind of light years ahead of its time. I mean, obviously, they were available, but you know, he yeah. was a mega, playing a mega famous actor from Hollywood, so that's not as much of a surprise. Oh yeah, yeah. He's also trying to call somebody in the middle of the ghetto in New York in like 1990, 1991, and I'm like. How much signal was available in that area? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like you I have trouble getting signals now. You sure, know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, that was a fun one to kind of revisit. Oddly enough, still is still about as funny as I remember it. Hmm, and uh, James Woods, yeah. despite being a complete cretin now, boy, I forgot. Sure. I just not only was he just a great actor, but he was actually rather gifted at comedy. But that's oh yeah, yeah. Um, I love him in Salvador. If you ever saw that, I That's watched cool. Salvador again for the first time in a long time recently. That is a strong, strong movie. Uh, it's a brilliant of, piece of work. One of He's Oliver's great. best films. Yeah, John Savage too. It's great in it. John yeah. Savage and, and Belushi and mm -hmm. uh, some other some other folks that you know. It's uh it's a murky. It's it's murkily told a bit because there's sure. so much going on. But yeah. it's, so for 1986 when it came out. 
it's very reminis- reminiscent of the 70s films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, beautifully done. Beautifully done on all of I can't even imagine how hard that production was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we got lucky on both of my films. There were, you know, there's always the hell days uh, that you try to prepare for. But like, uh, you know, everybody on both crews and in both casts were just like, terrific easy to work with and i've worked on a lot of other films where all it takes is one cast member or just the right crew member to just make everything hell but i definitely you know i worked on innocent blood in the in the 90s right. yeah, and, I saw that. and it was uh we had some of the coldest days of the century and we're shooting on rooftops and and um it's funny how like just the conditions you're shooting in can just make it uh, a whole different experience and uh, I, I i remember liking that film I, i'm not a giant fan of horror films but that is a that's what i've been wanting to revisit for a while there's a very interesting take on the vampire uh, yeah yeah saga. the woman that was in la femme nikita was mm-hmm. and perio yeah 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 and Robert Loggia's in it. Uh, Robert Loggia, yeah. Did you get to meet him at all? I did. I, I got to meet all of them. I, like it was, a, it's a, and like every John Landis film, there's great cameos from people. Yeah, like yeah. you know, Frank Oz was in that. You know, and yeah. Don Rickles and half the cast of The Sopranos and before yeah, they well, were famous. Yeah, well, that's Anthony they were kind of stock. They were kind of stock. Uh, yeah, Italian guy. You see them. See some of those guys. You see Pauly back in goodfellas mm-hmm. yeah exactly yeah all those Which guys were, hilarious yeah, they were getting those parts before they like owned those parts in the sopranos yeah but yeah uh, yeah, yeah yeah but yeah the yeah, innocent blood it actually holds up fairly well it's funny it's it's like a comedy take on the vampire genre so, right yeah. i remember it doing nothing when it came out but it was i liked it actually i thought it was a, a fun yeah film yeah, it was it was the first thing I'd worked on back then that had massive stunts, like twenty eight cars, like uh, crashing into each other on the highway in Pittsburgh and blowing up a bus and people jumping off buildings and stuff. So that was a lot of fun, and then a lot of visual effects too, with you know, yeah. like the the guys that wound up, you know, uh, I think it was even the K and B crew that wound up doing uh, like Walking Dead effects and stuff like that. If I'm not okay. mistaken. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was it was an experience. But what I'm saying is that you know you're talking about Salvador being a tough shoot to right, right, right to handle. And I'm saying like yeah, I, if it's too hot or too cold or muddy or rainy, it's funny how it's you know it's like if you were working in an office and it was raining on you all day, it, was, it yeah. becomes it becomes difficult. Well, a, a friend of mine, uh, Joe Carnahan, directed The Gray, mm-hmm. and. I always think whenever I see any, like the Revenant or something, I'm like, yeah. I am a big person that hates being out in the elements in, in winter. Me too. I could not even imagine making a damn film in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. <laughs> in the winter. It's like, it's just, just I don't know. I, I just, I, I, I understand you've got to, but you got like two weeks into it, you got to be like, why the hell? Did I decide to make this? Film? Oh yeah, yeah. On on Innocent Blood, I remember the, the the girl I was living with at the time. Her family was telling me that you know they the warnings are don't go outside today. It's the coldest day of the right. century. Don't right. go outside. You know, so the film's going to be canceled. You shouldn't even show up. And I kept saying, you don't understand the film crews. They're <laughs> that's you know Nobody when they gets, say only yeah. emergencies, they feel like well we're we're a film emergency and back in those days we're shooting 35 millimeter film and if you shoot in cold enough temperatures the film just snaps in the camera constantly yeah. and so you put up a new magazine of film on the camera and the minute the motor gets to 24 frames a second it's uh the film has a tendency to snap and so you know and if you try to warm the magazines then it can fog the film so yeah. it's a it's a catch 22 there's you know you don't know which way is better do you risk fogged film or do you risk broken snapping film? it yeah yeah well um, what other what other films um of note did you have you worked on what could you would you say i mean yeah i work ones memorable ones i guess yeah i worked on dogma the kevin smith film okay yeah i read uh, that you were involved in the scene in the bathroom yeah yeah i uh yeah with the 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 uh i forget what they called the creature but it was the probably the shit monster yeah it was yeah whether whatever they called it it was the <laughs> shit monster and yeah that was one of the memorable days on that shoot and and uh yeah it was it was it was cool to work with kevin and and jason muse silent bob and jay and you know ben affleck and matt damon and yeah uh you know 
George Carlin and uh, Alanis oh, Morissette, yeah. a lot of you know, a lot of good people in that, and Chris Rock, I think, if I'm right, you know. yeah, Chris, um, yeah. Linda Fiorentino, yep, yep, Linda, and uh, Alan Rickman, who I worked with on two different films, right, 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 um, and uh, I'm forgetting one more. There's one more really good one in there, but uh, yeah, I, um, I'm a lot of times so I've seen it. Yeah, same here. I, I really enjoyed it. It's funny when I was on the set. I didn't think it was going to be very good. I have, I hate to admit because it, it, uh, I, I think I underestimated the absolute charm of, of what Kevin Smith does at the time. I had seen clerks and, uh, probably had seen mall rats at that point. But, uh, um, I remember working on that and I was thinking it's just not going to work, but then the charm of silent Bob and Jay alone gets you through. And then there's all that rest yeah. of the cast, but I worked on Bob Roberts, which not everyone knows, but it's a great, well, I, re- I saw Bob, I remember seeing Bob Roberts. I think I saw it in the theater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, another amazing cast with also Alan Rickman and, yeah. uh, Ray Wise from twin peaks and, right. and, uh, an early, and uh, Jack black. Yeah. Yeah. That was his first role. Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story. I, I, of course, nobody knew who Jack Black was at the time. Um, the credits list me as an electrician on that movie, but I was a camera assistant except for one day where I jumped in and worked as an electrician to help out. Um, but I was a camera assistant the rest of the time. And you can see me in shots, especially in the first scene. You see me assisting the steady cam when they're on stage because in that movie you can see the crew because it's right. a fake documentary. But Jack Black was... Uh, Nobody knew who he was because obviously it's his first role. He had done like uh, his first real role, I guess. And um, his character is supposed to be a guy that goes becomes a crazier and crazier follower of the right wing folk singer, Bob Roberts. Right. At one point, he's got a little swastika drawn on his head. And, you know, as a liberal Jew myself, I'm I'm seeing this guy on set with like a skinhead. And, you know, he's got the two other guys and, uh, you know, um, uh, and I, uh, you know, I, I immediately, and he had a lot of that Jack Black energy, but he wasn't around me enough for me to realize that he was being funny, but he was very much in character, very much being this, um, inhabiting this sort of crazed follower character and uh, got there early to a set one day where uh, I was going to have to actually be up in a condor crane overlooking stuff, manning a light. And um uh, and while they were setting that up, he was there uh, and he was running dialogue with the other two crazed follower guys. And it's a scene where he's yelling at and bullying the other guy. And I was pretty new on film sets at that point. And I didn't realize that they were actors running dialogue. I thought they were just, um, you know, bit players in the film who were, uh, and I thought he was bullying the smaller kid. And I, you know, trying to be a good guy. I remember getting down off the equipment truck and marching directly over at Jack Black, ready to just intervene and go, you leave him alone. And at the very last second, as I arrived there, I realized, oh, they're running dialogue. But I like, I nearly picked a fight with Jack Black unnecessarily. He was a perfectly nice person. Yeah, Uh, just playing a completely horrible person. Yeah, and but doing so, so believably in rehearsal that I was ready to go try to defend the smaller kid. (laughs) (laughs) When I see them in that movie, I always think of that. I can remember that feeling of you, you know, no, you little swastika headed guy will not yeah, yeah. on this kid, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's, that's interesting. That's funny. That's yeah. fun. Well, let's, you know, um, let's talk a little bit about, you've also done a bunch of work in, in music videos. You mentioned Jesse earlier. And then for uh, those of you who know me, I know that I'm uh, friends and, with and a big fan of Jesse Mallon, the Me too. New York singer songwriter, and he's uh, was a D generation, and he's a uh, frequent guest over the years on whatever I've been doing. But if you want to check out his interview, that's uh, available as well to check out. Uh, you've done a, a bunch of work on on his videos. Mm-hmm. What other what other videos have you have you done work on or have you you've directed some like if we could concentrate on ones you've actually ended up directing? Well, I, I directed um, I directed one for a, a, a musician that you, know, you uh, likely wouldn't have heard of uh, who I used to play guitar with. Uh, her name's Michelle Vargo. I directed a music video for her, but you won't find that one online. But I did two Jesse Mallon videos that can still find out there. I did his modern world video a few years back. Mm-hmm. 
and uh and i did his disco ghetto video which is the one with mary louise parker yeah that one and um i worked on a ton of other music videos over the years um in other capacity as crew member but uh those are the only three i think that i've oh i thought for directed. some reason i thought you did directed more videos i don't know why no no it's okay i i did uh um uh, I, uh, no, those are the only, I, I've, it's funny, I've come close a couple of times where people have asked me to direct a video and gotcha. uh, I even, you know, got into pre-production on a couple of them. And then, uh, you know, sometimes for record company reasons, just the, you know, the, the video doesn't wind up happening. Um, gotcha. but no, gotcha. the, the main ones I did that you, that anyone would have seen would probably be the Jesse ones. Okay. Uh, I may do another one for him soon. We've talked about it. And, yeah. He's uh, got the, the new album coming mm -hmm. out. Yeah, which is great. Um, I don't know if you've heard it yet, but it's great. I haven't heard. I've heard. Well, I mean, at this point, I've heard most of it. It's a double album, so I've mm -hmm. heard a fair amount of what he's already put out. And I, have, I, you know, I just, you know, I, 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 he's a guy that I remember when I, I, early in my career of writing, um, I started out writing about music. Um, after I turned thirty, I had written for years before that but i had a, my 20s are a bit of a, a blur in, mm -hmm. in a ways i get you the internet kind of came along i had this ability to kind of write and so i hooked up with an online magazine you know nobody famous but at the time it was you know something happening mm -hmm. and um they would send you know say well how about talking to this guy you know he's playing at this place and you know we could set it up and you just go meet and talk with him and i didn't know who jesse was uh, I, had, I had listened to the first album that he made, the first solo album that he made. I didn't know D Generation at all, to be honest, because they were kind of in the 90s when what I was listening to, that what they were, were so different from what I was into that I, that I just wasn't in the, in the headspace to hear them. Mm -hmm. I listened to the album and I, I, I dug what I was hearing um, and I, I went and met him and it's like one of those things, like it became... You know, it's like, it's weird how you meet people in the weirdest ways and you become kind of friends with them. Sure. And, yeah. Um, Jesse's great that way too. Yeah. He's, easy yeah, he's to a, good friends with he, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And I can't, I, I think I've probably seen him live more than I've seen anyone. That live. might be true for me too. I tour managed for him for a long time. So I feel oh, like. Oh, really? I, yeah. I've That's probably him. why you look a little familiar. Mm -hmm. Were you, okay. What was the last year you tour managed? Uh probably 2008 maybe something like that okay. so that's maybe 2009 like, hell i might have dealt, i might have dealt with you a few times and not even remembered might have yeah yeah it's uh yeah because yeah. um yeah there were a bunch of times uh there were many many fun nights after shows that i don't really remember very well <laughs> um but, <laughs> but um what was I going to say? Well, so basically, like, you know, they just, it's just that, you know, it's kind of cool to see somebody just kind of come up and, and the love everyone has for, for Jesse is amazing. Sure. And that's how, honestly, that's how I came to know about you and your film because he, you know, just did a social media post saying, hey, my friend Harry's got this movie out, check it out. And I was like, you know, I mean, I've talked to Don DeLego who, Sure. Him and Jesse are involved in, in Velvet Elk, and sure. you know, I, yeah. I, I try to pass the love around, you know, because when some you were friends with somebody, you want to help the people that they know and help, you know, help out them. And Don DeLego is another person I've talked about doing a music video with. He, yeah, he, he asked about one. He's a very he, nice guy. Yeah, and we have music from Jesse in both of my films. And yes, both, and yes, yes even shoot in his apartment in, uh, in oh, the year after. And then uh, he was kind enough to let us take over his apartment for the the scene with the parents in, uh, in Hereafter. Yeah. Is and, that noise uh, on your end? That is. That's, um, there's, they're, <laughs> they're turning a, a, an old coffee shop into a... No, no, it's a, just, a it, sounded very, it, it sounded very, it sounded very... Uh, <laughs> ghostly, and oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> hearing things. Am I losing yeah. my mind? No, no, no. It's no. um. There's they're doing uh a coffee. The, if you see in the movie right next to the doorway, uh, there's a place that says Cafe Jacks. I live right above that. And, okay, cool. Uh, 
and that, that place closed during the pandemic and now they're turning uh, into some sort of a french cafe and it's there's construction occasionally but uh yeah, so no 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 i just okay. yeah yeah i just sometimes i think i'm losing my mind and <laughs> <laughs> me too i mean it's, like, ni- I it's to nice know. to know that i'm not in this case uh well i don't i don't want to take up too much of your time but i do want to find out kind of is there oh my god i am i apologize i ate a couple hours ago it's coming back up on me. no worries man um is there anything you're kind of trying to work on in in this crazy time you know that we're all in right now is there anything that you're looking well, at for your next thing well i have a i have a horror script that i intended to do next um i'm not like the world's biggest horror guy but i i, I had a script where uh that was always my intention to do that next but also during um during the time while waiting to get the distribution together for hereafter, I I wrote another um, sort of film more in the vein of hereafter, more of like a philosophical, uh, uh, hopefully somewhat comedic uh, film. And so I'm torn as to which one to do next. But I, you know, the pandemic kind of puts a, a crimp in your plans with anything. But uh, um and the other thing I'm really focused on is, is just finishing up distribution for Staring at the Sun, my first film, because I really, I still strongly believe in that film. and want to get that out there. But, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, up until only about a month ago, I was still working hard to get Hereafter <laughs> out because mm-hmm. it's a, you know, that's such a process. I had no idea when I got into making these films that it's, you know, the distribution process is a, it's its own, um, you know, labyrinth that you got to find your way through. And uh, yeah. Yeah, there's not much more. There's not much room anymore for certain films. I mean, yeah, I, um, I, one of the big megaplexes that I go to does have specialty films, like they're showing the Card Counter by Paul Schrader this coming mm-hmm. year. Uh, they're playing Small Engine Repair, this indie film with John Bernthal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's from our same distributor. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. That's from Vertical. That's our same yeah. distributor. Yeah. Nice. You know, so there are some films that still get a release, but you still have to have somebody kind of, you know, you got you have to have something that's got a little bit of juice to it, I guess. And, you know, John Bernthal's fast becoming, you know, a sure. big name. Yeah, we, Blame. yeah, uh, yeah uh, I, I uh, before he was too well known, I, I, I looked at him for a part and, uh, you know, I think he blew up too quickly for us to get him. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But it's, yeah, we went to the American film market and when you go around there, you know, like you're dealing with all the distributors and, one thing I learned there is basically they're saying, well, you know, uh, so which genre is your film? Is it horror or is it action? Because basically that's that's all a lot of the distributors right. are looking for, especially for foreign, because it's sort of, you know, you can, uh, you don't need to translate horror or action, uh, and you know, as much and you don't need to, you know, like everyone can kind of identify with that. Whereas like, you know, like hereafter being a bit of a love letter to New York, you know, there's a lot of things in it, like you said, that are somewhat New York specific. And, you know, yeah. oddly enough, we're, we're being distributed in 56 countries, which is very strange. I keep yeah. picturing, I don't know what they'll make of this in Taiwan, but. Uh, well, you know, I mean, look at all the films that, you know, I mean, Americans are, are big um, recipients of, of foreign, foreign films. I mean, look how sure. big French films can be, you mm-hmm. know, you know, granted they're not, it's not the next Avengers movie, but I mean, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's still, That's there, what I mean. yeah. there's, a, there, there's, there's no doubt. Um, a way to re- for other countries to receive non, you know, steroidal, you know, American product, I guess. Sure. But I think it's distributors see it as a safer bet, I think to do horror right, or, or, right. or action. No, and, I get uh, that. Yeah. And, you know, comedy is a, you know, doesn't always translate. Like I, you know, I know that we're, you know, we're apparently, you know, like Afghanistan was one of the countries that we sold the, sold the rights to the film for. And I think yeah, like, right. for instance, I don't know that that will be screening no, there. Obviously. No, I and, uh, so. I don't, I don't right. And I don't mean to there's make light be, of a tragedy. No, no, I, there's just not going to be much fun had in Afghanistan exactly. from yeah. now on. I, I don't see yeah. Well, I've, yeah, there's, I have like 17 scripts that I'm sort of sitting on, but like I have the oh. two scripts that were like, uh, those are the ones you, you think know. you're going to push out the door first. Yeah, but I'd like to, I wrote a um, sort of a Pixar type animated film too that I'd love to sell since I can't make that one myself and uh, uh, kind of proud of the idea. And, uh, 
you know, a whole bunch of other, you know, like a straight ahead comedy thing that sort of takes place in the rock and roll world because I've lived in that world a bunch. And so, uh, you know, and I've uh, and I know a bunch of the people that would help populate that since, you know, partly thanks to Jesse again. I know some of the right people that could sort of be in the periphery of that and could do like. I like the idea of sort of doing like the player, the Robert Altman, Tim Robbins film. Right, right. It uh, takes place in the the rock and roll world. So it's kind of that is the idea. There goes that construction again. Yeah, no, no, this, this time I wasn't as freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and, and so, uh, yeah, I'd like to, but either of the two that I mentioned would be the ones I'd like to do next if I could. It's, uh, but I may get my feet wet again in directing just by doing a Jesse video if I can. That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah, I, I, I would imagine that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, and I love this. I love the everything on this new record. So I feel like it's, I'm it's sounding it. great so far. I mean, I, I have to imagine I've heard half of it by now. So yeah, yeah. Um, well, the other half is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank you for taking the time today, Harry. And um, you know, I wish you the best of luck. And as a reminder, hereafter is available to. Uh, get on video on demand pretty much anywhere we'll of course have links set up when this airs uh just go and and, and buy the film and, and check it out it's a it's a fun movie uh besides christina ricci uh andy carl who some may know from law and order svu is in it uh i actually interviewed his wife uh, uh, yeah. yeah yeah uh last year and she was she was uh, a good interview uh she's great funny enough, yeah, yeah um and uh yeah so we'll we'll post like Rispoli. yeah a lot of, a lot of good people in, in in that movie so you reminded me when you asked other things i'd worked on i forgot to mention pounds an amazing film i worked on lbs pounds um it's a beautiful film played at sundance it's got an independent spirit award nomination oh, uh really? and i highly recommend it it's uh um, Carmine Femigletti, who produced um, both of my films, he wrote and starred in it, and it's a okay. beautiful, beautiful film. Check it out if you can. That's one of my favorite things I've ever worked on, besides Bob Roberts. So, oh, awesome. Okay, yeah, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. All right, well, Harry, thank you again for taking the time. I, I wish you the best of luck going forward. And, thank you. Um, I'll, of course, let you know when this goes up. Okay. Thanks for doing the interview, and thanks for checking no, out the film. No, it thank was really you. Good to meet you. It's good to meet you too, Harry. All right, you have All a right. good one. All right, you too. Thanks, man. All right, bye. bye.